don't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the time. Um, next year, me and Nikki have been married for 30 years. <laughs> and, and we said we would go on a special holiday. And we said this a while ago. We'll go on a special holiday when we've been married 30 years. Yes. Every now and again we remind each other. We are, we are going on a special holiday when we've been married 30 years. Oh yes, definitely. And it wasn't that we didn't know, have any ideas of what to do for a special holiday. It's just that we, we couldn't pick one. Uh, and sometimes we'd tell somebody, hey, we've been married almost 30 years. Next year we're going on a special holiday. And they'd say, oh wow, you know what you could do? You could do this. And oh, that, that doesn't help at all. I've just got more things I could pick one. Um, <laughs> Sorry? Bob and his eyes have been there, not a special one there. Um, I think it was on Friday, we finally picked where we were going to go. We we're going to go to the Lake District. Oh. And suddenly, because we got like that big thing planned, lots of other things started to fall into place and we start, could start to make more plans. Um, have you ever asked yourself, what, what am I supposed to be doing? Our oldest son Nathaniel has just finished his degree and kind of up until this point he's just been picking options and things like that, what he's good at, what he enjoys and now, now it's time to get a job. What, what, am I, what am I supposed to be doing? You can go to Indeed and there's a search box <laughs> But you've got to know what to put into the search box, right? What am I supposed to be doing? Maybe you've had those, those moments, what am I supposed to be doing? Maybe it's about jobs or, or houses or other big decisions. Sometimes we get to ask that about our, our Christian lives. What am, I, what am I supposed to be doing? I see all the little bits and pieces. How, how does it all fit together and have meaning? What's, where's the big thing that suddenly makes sense of all the little things? Because the overall big thing, it matters. It's like, it's like if water has a destination, and it's flowing and it's filled with life. If water's got nowhere to go, it just kind of sits there and gets a bit, a bit stagnant maybe. Now thankfully, Jesus did not leave his disciples asking themselves, what are we supposed to be doing? Who are? He gave them a commission. And not just any old commission, he gave them a great commission. Um, so we're doing a new series on discipleship, and I wanted to start that, that series off looking at uh, the great commission. So, I'm turning right round to see this, aren't I? It's right behind me. How far left or right can I move? A little bit. If I'm, in, I'm not an hour. Oh. Okay, so this is right at the end of Jesus' time on earth before he goes to heaven. Matthew chapter 28. I'm reading from the, the New Living Translation. Feel free to read along in anything you want. Jesus came and told his disciples. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's just uh, three takeaway points I want to take from what Jesus says here. First is Jesus will. Second one, make disciples. That's the theme of, of this season, series we're going with. And lastly, and be with Jesus. So Jesus will. He says, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. See, Jesus didn't lose at the cross when he died. And it wasn't, it wasn't a draw. He died and then he rose again, one each. Jesus, Jesus won. Um, there's a, a loads of 
bits in the Old Testament of Bible written before Jesus came pointing to this. One of them is, is this from Daniel 7. This is part of a long prophetic dream that Daniel has. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man. This is the title that Jesus took for himself, the son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honour and sovereignty over all the nations of the world, so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal, it will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Jesus won. He came into God's presence, he sat at God's right hand. He was his rule is eternal, his kingdom is everlasting, all the nations will follow him. Why? Because God's got a plan for the whole world, and it's this. For as the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. This is, this is God's heart, that people would know him, really, really know him personally. Nothing to separate. We were singing songs earlier about this. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Let the whole world see the glory of the risen King. God is good and loving, and He has made a way for everybody to know Him. And then He says, make disciples. Because Jesus has won and because God's plan is for all the nations of the world, he says, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth, therefore can we make disciples of all the nations? And we're going to come back to this because this is the main theme today. But I just wanted to also make sure we covered this and be with Jesus. He says right at the end of this passage, I am with you always. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In all of the activity that we can sometimes get into as people in general, but as Christians and as a church, don't forget it's about being with Jesus. At the end of John's Gospel, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. There's this kind of like Jesus' vine with, with healthy juices flowing through him, which then goes and feeds the branches. That's, that's what we need to be like. We can't do it without Jesus. And, and honestly, why would we want to? Where's the fun in, in trying to do it when you've not got the life of the vine? We were praying earlier before the meeting, and I was just reminded of, of a story from the Bible where one of Jesus' friends called Lazarus is sick. Actually, he's really sick, he's almost dying. And somebody comes and says to Jesus, Jesus, your friend Lazarus is sick. And all the disciples say, well, we better get there quick so you can, you can do your healing, Jesus. And Jesus stays where he is for a few more days before he goes. And it's like, it's not always about rushing into the activity. Sometimes you just need to make sure you're properly connected. Okay, back to making disciples. Uh, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. And you might think, well, that's a, that's a big thing to drop just before you go, Jesus. Make disciples of all the nations. How are they going to know what to do? But actually, Jesus has been teaching them this for three years. And at this point, we ought to say, what is a disciple? Um, and it's not really the same as, as just a believer. A disciple is like a, a hands-on learner. It's like an apprentice. Somebody who's trying to learn on the job. 
from somebody who's just that bit further ahead of them. So Nikki's work does apprenticeships, and Nikki, Nikki's company uh, does IT support for schools, and they take on apprentices. And what they do is they take an apprentice and they pair them up in a school with somebody who's more senior and knows the job. And there's a little bit of classroom learning, but mostly it's on the job training. Um, and after that, the apprentices know how to do IT support for schools. And not only that, they know how to do it like their mentor was doing it, with the same kind of attitudes and culture and way of doing things. Jesus made disciples. And so at the end of the, the three years, the disciples knew how to make disciples. They'd been learning it from the best disciple maker. This is right at the beginning of Peter's story in the Bible. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon was called Peter and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish with people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. The goal for the disciples wasn't just that they'd have a wonderful time with Jesus. The goal was that they'd become disciple makers too. So, how did Jesus make disciples? That's what this whole series is going to be about. Um, I'm just going to run through some things quickly and I need to apologise because they all rhyme. I know, I know, it's terrible. I, it came to me and once it had come to me, I, I, it was just lodged. So maybe, maybe it will lodge in your thinking as well. Okay, how did Jesus make disciples? He drew them. I'm going to go through more quickly and then He knew them, he grew them, he glued them. Thank you. And he flew them. <laughs> What? I know, right? Okay. I've, I've got my apology in, so I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> it even rhymes. It, 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 it's, it's a five news. No, no, it's not going to rhyme. He drew them. He, he invited them to follow him. And it was an invitation. It wasn't a, a demand. He didn't enforce it. He said, come and follow me. And they, they decided to follow them. It was an invitation. He drew them. Because that's, there's something healthy about that. He drew them to himself. And when we tell, I mean, we love it when people come to church, but it's not really about us. It's about Jesus. We want people to be drawn to Jesus. He knew them. They walked together. They ate together. They talked together. They Sometimes slept in the same house together, and if they didn't have a house to sleep in, they slept under the same stars together. They, they shared life. He knew them, and they knew him. It was very, very relational. He grew them. He, he invested his time and his teaching and his life in them, and it changed them as a there's a story of one of the disciples called John, and his nickname was Son of Thunder. I don't know what kind of guy you've got to be to have a nickname like Son of Thunder. Um, and yet, we read his letters and his books in the Bible, and they're just full of love. Oh, it's just like loving other people and loving God is just the most important thing. Something changed in John from being the Son of Thunder to the guy who's always writing about love. He glued them. These weren't just like individuals, not together. They were a team. There's a bit when they're all in Jerusalem praying together and the Holy Spirit comes. And the Bible is very clear that they were all together praying and then the Holy Spirit came at them at Pentecost. And then the last one's a bit of a stretch. He flew them. He, he let them spread their wings and have a go. So he sent them out in twos, said, what I've been teaching you, try and put it into practice. And then they came back 
and they, they had a chat about what worked and what didn't and how, how things had gone. He flew them. So, did they get it? Did they learn from Jesus how to make disciples and do it in the same way? And I think they did. There's a, there's a story in Acts chapter 10, and I'm not going to go through it in detail, but, it's, it, but I will keep on referring to it, where Peter is on the house of his roof praying. And while he's praying, three people are coming to him. That Peter's a Jew, and these three people aren't Jews, which is at that point in the Bible still a bit of a, an issue. Uh, and they're on their way from a chap called Cornelius in Caesarea. And God says to Peter, three men have come looking for you. This is before they even arrive. Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. And don't worry about anything, for I have sent them. And Peter knows what to do. He drew them. He invited them into his house. According to the Jewish culture at the time, he shouldn't have been able to do that because he was a Jew, they were Jews. He drew them in. He sees that God is at work in them and draws them in. He knew them. They were his guests overnight. They would have eaten together that evening, eaten together in the morning, and then he travels with them the next day. He grew them. He gets to Caesarea and Cornelius and he tells them all about Jesus. And the Holy Spirit comes. And this is, this is amazing. This is the first time in the Bible you see the Holy Spirit coming on people who weren't Jewish. He glues them. He sees the Holy Spirit come and he says, these people are like us. We need to get them baptised, they're part of the family, they're, they're one of us. He clues them, he joins them in. Then he keeps on deciding for a bit, and then I'd love to finish off and say, see how he flew them. You don't actually see that in this part of Acts chapter 10, but what you do see, later on in, chapter, in Acts, in Acts 21, Paul is travelling to Jerusalem. And on his way, you see a community of believers coming to help him from Caesarea. Something landed in Caesarea, some community of believers grew. Jesus won, make disciples, and actually, it's make disciples. Who can make disciples? Who can make disciples? That's part of doing everything that I have commanded you. Make disciples, you can make disciples and be with Jesus. And so, discipleship or apprenticeship is part of what we do as a church. Part of that is through this kind of thing, Sunday teaching. But really that's only, if you want to do it like Jesus, that should only be a small part of it. Because an apprenticeship is a hands-on learning, kind of with somebody sharing a lifetime thing. Part of it is from our midweek communities when we get together. Whenever we pray together, whenever we encourage one another, uh, whenever we, we teach one another, whenever we help one another, we're part of that disciple-making process. We're showing each other a bit more of what Jesus is like and how he does things. Part of it is on a more of a one-to-one -one level. One of the things we do as a church is called personal pastoring. And uh, it sounds fancy. It, it's really just getting together with somebody who's a bit further on than you and catching something from them about the life of Jesus. So the next few weeks we're going to be doing more in depth about how Jesus made disciples. And as we go through, there's going to be a dual focus. 
part of it is, how does this apply to me as someone who is learning? And how does this apply to me as someone who has got stuff to share with others? Because I think, would you be a Christian for, I don't know, three months, six months? You're probably in a position where you've got something you can pass on to somebody else. And you know, we sometimes raise that bar a bit too high. Going back to what I was saying at the beginning about when, when me and Nikki decided we were going to the Lake District and then things fell into place, there is, a, there is a big picture for your life. You have a great commission. And it looks different for different ones of us, but it will involve being a learner, being an apprentice, and being somebody who can pass things on to other people. So I want to leave you with some, some questions. Where am I in that as someone who is being discipled? Am I growing? Am I exercising faith? Has God put stuff in me that he wants to see grow and develop? Or maybe I've just got I've just got to go back a step and remember to be with Jesus. Because Jesus has made a way for every single one of us to be with him. He is alive and he loves us. I mean, I love. I love my wife, I love my kids. It is minuscule compared to the amount that God loves us and how much he does for us. Where am I as someone who's learning? Where am I as someone who you could pass on wisdom or experience or be willing to pray for somebody or hear God for somebody. What is my next step in these things? And it may be that you're not really clear what your next step is in these things. In which case, honestly, the best thing you can do is just talk to somebody else, talk to somebody who you know has got your back and cares for you and they can perhaps point you in the right direction. Because if we get this as a church, if we are all learners ourselves and growing ourselves and we're all investing in others, if we are people who can be those who will, oh, I need to say this in the past sentence, who will do people and new people, <coughs> and group people, and glue people, and flu people. And that will make a massive difference in so many people's lives. And as the waters fill the sea, so the earth can be filled with people who know the Lord. Amen. <laughs>